Hey there, welcome to Tips and Techniques for Actors, Authors, and Storytellers. I'm Matthew Arkin. My guest today is David Rambo. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to remind everybody that you're welcome to ask questions and leave comments in the chat as the conversation proceeds. And also, please, if you haven't already, subscribe to this channel. And when you do, remember to click the bell icon so that you get notifications of all of the upcoming live streams with different artists, storytellers, producers, actors, directors, folks of every stripe from the entertainment industry who will have lots of useful information for you as you go on your artistic journey. So without further ado, my guest today is David Rambo, writer, producer. Welcome, David. Good to have you. It's great to be here. Thank you, Matt. So uh, let's jump in. I want to hear a little bit about your origin story. I like uh, to give people an opportunity to tell where they came from, what got them into this wonderful business. Well, mommy and daddy loved each other very much. <laughs> and soon after there was a miracle. They had a special hug. <laughs> My story, um, I mean, obviously uh, I'm, a, I'm a playwright and I write and produce dramatic television now, but... Uh, my sort of show business beginnings were uh, as a teenage musician and actor uh, where we lived in rural Pennsylvania, just outside Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a great city. You can go 30 minutes out of it in almost any direction except toward New Jersey and you're in the country. And that's, uh, that's where I came from. And I was a showbiz crazy kid. Uh, the cornfields didn't hold the allure for me that old movies did on television or right. performing live. I started playing the piano in bars when I was 15, uh, sometimes in a combo with my sister who played the trombone and one of many drummers we had from time to time and a marvelous vocalist. And uh, when I was 18, I wanted to go to New York and study acting. I'd been working in the theater as an actor in the Philadelphia area, summer stock or you know, things like that, and right. school things. I loved doing plays and musicals at school. And I was set to go to college, and then we had a family situation that made that impossible. So I moved to New York at 18. Wow. And I took <laughs> way too young, believe me. But I didn't know that. I was full of confidence and uh, had new tap shoes and a lot of ambition. I played the bars in New York as well. You know, I played the piano and the theater bars around Times Square and in the village and uptown. Uh, when you could get an uptown booking, you needed really nice clothes to get those. Right. <laughs> But uh, I, it was all to pay for acting classes. And I studied with some great teachers, notably uh, a woman named Joanna Merlin, who you probably know. I know Joanna. Yeah. yeah. She was the greatest teacher. And uh, even in my work today, I hearken back as I'm writing scenes to things that Joanna taught us decades ago that still resonate. The truth. That's the thing about truth. It's always true. And uh, to have that point of view on my work. Uh, I'm very grateful to Joanna for giving me that. Yeah, but then I, wonderful yeah, I came out to Los Angeles to try to work in television and I did very well right off the bat. I starred in a pilot at ABC with Crispin Glover and Nicolas Cage when wow. they were teenagers. I was a bit past my teen years, but passing. And we played best friends singing and dancing our way through life's adolescent uh, life's travails and challenges. But I found even after making commercials and stuff, I just hated working in front of the camera. Really? I never really loved it. I never loved it. And you know, I wasn't that good at it. I think that's the bottom. I didn't understand the intimacy of it. I do now, but I have no desire to act anymore. But I still loved the theater. So I started selling real estate to be able to make a living so I could afford to work more in the theater and not have to do deodorant and snack food commercials to make right. a living. I, I just hated those. I just hated them. And I was lucky to have them. I wasn't ungrateful. I just hated doing it. And uh, I was good at real estate. I sold real estate for 14 years. It was after about seven years of selling real estate, quite successfully having a great time. I was sitting alone in an open house in the Studio City side of Laurel Canyon in a beautiful Glen an ugly house that no one was coming into. It was raining and the house was all white and it was raining. I was praying no one would come in. I took the information sheets that said, David Rambo presents five bedroom beauty south of the boulevard. And I turned it to the blank side 
and I started writing what became my first play. I didn't know that I wanted to write. I'd kind of been thinking about it. But when I came home, and by the way, I went through all the information sheets and then closed up the open house and came home and started typing. I realized this is something I wanted to do. It was that that uh, Damascus moment for me. That's a great story. The, the title of the play should have been Five Bedroom Beauty. <laughs> that play is yet to be written. <laughs> And, you know, I wrote plays that, you know, we did in small theater here in LA and quite successfully. It was, I had a lot of fun doing it, but I had an agent in New York at that point who liked my writing, just said, you're not writing anything producible. I sent her a three actor play called God's Man in Texas in 1998. And she wrote back and meter called me. She said, I can place this. I know who's going to do it. Mark my words. This will premiere at the Humana Festival. And it did. Okay. In uh, March of 99. And I got a career out of that. After the Geffen Playhouse produced it here in Los Angeles, uh, I got the call to go to work on CSI. And that was my first TV job. Okay. Who are you working with on CSI at the time? Who were the, who is the showrunner? The showrunner was Carol Mendelson. Right. She was the okay. original showrunner. Carol and did you ever do CSI? No. Matt? Yeah. I, uh, I yeah, because I didn't think you did it. In my I was there no. for seven seasons, seasons four through ten. Um, I freelanced in season four and then was on staff for five through ten. Uh, uh, Carol and Ann Donahue were the showrunners, although Ann had just split off to run Miami. So even though both names were on, Carol ran Vegas, the original, the one I did. Right. Ann ran CSI Miami, and I got a job on, on staff because they created CSI New York. And some of the writers went to that. So there was an empty chair in the room and they liked me. Great. Yeah. Um, I want to ask, wh what was it that that fascinated you about the writing side as opposed to the, the performing side? Because I, I, I have, I'm, people come go into storytelling for different reasons. And I have very yeah. closely held personal beliefs about storytelling and what it is that interests me. Uh, but what is it about about storytelling in that form for you that, that really turns you on? That's such a great question. I, I did come to realize when I was writing, actually when I was selling real estate, that a lot of the reason I wanted to act was that I wanted to perform. I wanted the attention. I wanted to be recognized. And uh, maybe that's because I was an ambitious kid growing up on a hilltop in Southeast Pennsylvania between the pig farm and the dairy farm. But uh, I just loved being on the stage so much. But when I didn't, when I was achieving things in other ways, I feel like this is such a 70s self help answer. Um, when I was achieving things in other ways, I didn't need that anymore. I really didn't. And suddenly I still wanted to tell stories. I just found a different way to do it. And actually, I'm so glad I did all that performing. I think it's made me a much better writer, but what really made me a writer was sitting at those kitchen tables, making those real estate deals. In real estate, residential real estate, you make a sale and hopefully close it, because something very good or something very bad has happened in your prospect's life. So it's either comedy or tragedy, and right. it's an improvisation. There's an objective, which is the closed transaction, and there are obstacles, financing, inspection, qualifying, section two termite work. Uh, I think I thrived in it because I approached it as drama and played my part. But sitting at those, as I said, those kitchen tables, and in those living rooms and in the car, the front seat of the car with the client, when I sold a house to a very famous, uh, very famous film director. It was one of my biggest sales was toward the end of my career. And he loved this house so much. And we were on the phone in the front seat of my car and he was in tears because the business manager said he couldn't have it. He said, he's paying too much. And I just will never forget that he wanted that. And he got the house, by the way, and he right. paid what they were asking and or what we had agreed to. And I think he's still in it. And that was 20 plus years ago. So wow. it's worth it's worth more than he paid now. That's so fascinating that that story, uh, because, you know, I I had this detour from my performing life where I practiced law for uh, five years. 
and I did a lot of real estate. So close to what you were doing, yeah. but I was always there at the closing and it's that same yeah. event that you're talking about. And it's, it's the most boring transaction in the world. Yes. And I always tried to look at that closing as part of a story between these two people and to think about the transaction as somebody getting a home or losing, you know, giving up a home, somebody gaining a home and trying to get that meeting of the minds there. Because when I could get them involved in the story rather than the transaction, the day would be more interesting, at exactly. least for me. <laughs> and they're more invested in it. One of the ways, I can't tell you, Matt, how many sales I closed with a buyer who was thinking about this place, loved this place, just couldn't quite commit to making the offer. All I had to say was, I love this house. Where would you put the Christmas tree? And as soon as I got them to place the Christmas tree, and by the way, Jewish, Christian, didn't matter. It always worked. Where would you put the Christmas tree? They moved in because they weren't buying a house. They were buying Christmas and Thanksgiving and the staircase their daughter's going to walk down all dressed up for her first date. And the the, the den where they're going to comfort the kids when grandma dies. It's, it's all of that emotion. It's all story. And that's what, unless it was an investment property. And I loved that. And that's why I'm a writer today. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I hate the question that people ask. Uh, people ask me about, about my writing. I'm sure people ask you about your writing. And I've always hated this question. Where do you get your ideas? So I'm not going to ask you where you get your ideas because I, I I can't imagine not having ideas. Well, like, it's not like shopping. Like no, you go no. out and say, what looks good in the idea bin today? They right. come to you and they hang on and you write them. Exactly. But the question that I am always interested in when I talk to writers is, are there particular themes in your life or out in the world that you find yourself continue continually returning to uh yeah i do and it's only after writing for a couple of decades now that i'm able to see that i know that one of the uh one of the things that comes to me is uh education i'm from a family of teachers and i don't like writing didactic or pedantic characters but i do like people who love teaching um and for me teaching it connotes a kind of patience with someone with the other party so um, that sort of passing on of the lore of the craft or whatever. I wrote a, uh, a lovely one woman play about the advice columnist, Ann Landers. Uh -huh. And I became friends with her daughter, Margot, through the process. And uh, when Margot read it, she said, you know, you've really captured mother because your character is a teacher. And that's what she always thought she was. We'd never talked about that, but it came through on the page. That's a big theme for me. Um, I'm also a big believer, frankly, in the power of enduring love. I really like when I can write that. It's hard not to be sappy with that, so you have to watch it a little bit. But um, I've heard of that. Yeah. I've heard of enduring love. <laughs> yeah, it's possible. <laughs> I've been with my husband 45 years. We have a very... Uh, in some quarters, perhaps unusual story, but it's uh, it's the real deal. So when I can that's pretty, that's explore that in characters, that's fun yeah. too. Okay, yeah. great. Um, do you have? Uh, you told me that that one of the things you were interested in talking about today was the writer, the writer producer, actor relationship, which I love, absolutely. Um, you know, when I started on CSI, it's so interesting. Uh, Carol Mendelson and I met, she was the showrunner and she read a two character play I had written. It's called The Icebreaker. It's out there, it's published, it's been produced all over. Um, it's a science play and a love story between a guy and a girl. And she thought, wouldn't it be fun if we did a CSI episode that was just a two character play between Marg Helgenberger and uh, William Peterson? Well, <laughs> we started to try to do that, but it's CSI. They had us, right. you know, with six leads we had to service and we'd never got to that. There was one scene that ended up being the two character play. And it was a very good scene. It's my favorite scene in the episode. But um, uh, when we were uh, getting ready for it, 
Carol taught me about television. I'd never worked in television as a writer. I'd never worked in pre-production or casting or any of these things. And uh, Carol put me in the writer's room, but also put me on the set. She put me in post-production. I watched the editors. She sent me on location scouts. She sent me to learn everything I had could possibly learn for about six weeks before we started to break my story. And one thing that I was picking up was how much the writers on the show, in general, not all, but in general, really didn't enjoy being on the set. Uh, it's a writer-driven medium now, television. Writers really do produce. It means you're on the set, you are all those places. Right. But when it came time to uh, actually film that episode, Carol said, now listen, this is not the theater. Where it's just like eight o'clock in the morning on a Monday. We'd both driven there for this early, oh my gosh, she was so tired. And she said, this is not the theater. You say good morning to the actors when they come in and you say good night to the actors when they leave and that's it. Because if you say one other word, they're gonna try to get you to change everything and so help me if you do, you'll never work in this town again. And I remember thinking somebody actually said that. <laughs> somebody important said you'll never work in this town again. Wow. So I went on the set and the act, the, the director was from the theater. He studied theater at Northwestern with Mary Zimmerman wonderful guy, Richard Lewis. And he sort of took me under his wing. And when the actors would come to me with dialogue questions, remembering what I was told, I would pull Richard into the conversation always. And Marga Helgenberger had a suggestion. She said, why am I saying this? It isn't what I mean, boppity bop bop. So why don't I just say boppity bop bop? And I said, well, you could, but isn't it more interesting if you say, the line is written, but your subtext is boppity bop bop. And she paused. She said, this is the first time in four years someone on this show has used the word subtext. And she meant it as a good, as a good thing. And told Carol Mendelson she liked me. So that was the beginning of, of my enjoyment of being on the set. I always work with the director. It's the director's set. But uh, sometimes they'll tell you, just go take care of this question the actor has, or sometimes the actor has the question. I say, well, you know, let's all talk about it and pull the director into it. You have to respect what everybody's job is. And uh, I, I really enjoy it because television happens so fast. I mean, you know this, these things are written fairly quickly. Often many hands are on the page, not just the writer who's credited. And then you get to the set, there's really no time to explore it, to question no. it, to make discoveries. No. There's time to figure out where the actors stand, where the cameras are, and who's going to move where and when. That's it. So anything you can do uh, in those situations to help create a discovery or to make an actor feel better about a scene. Yeah. Uh, you know, there. I'm constantly trying to explain to my uh my acting students here in LA, not, not the university students, because they're writer, director, DP students, but my acting students, um, trying to explain to them how fast television is. Oh, and they yeah. don't, they don't believe it. They, they have no understanding of, they all think they're going to have time and attention on set to work on what their, what their performance is. They think it's going to be like class, and and I'm just constantly yeah. saying, no, you have to be performance ready at the callback. Yeah, because from callback to action on set, there's no time or rehearsal for you. Do you remember when the advice for actors at auditioning used to be, "Don't memorize it. Always use the page, or they'll expect a performance." Right. It's always a performance. Yeah. It is always a performance anyway. You've got to give yourself that edge. Come prepared, audition, knowing the words as cold yep. as you can. And you know, if you stumble, there's help in the room. They're casting a quality. But yes. the actor who comes in and is not prepared and uh, makes up dialogue, you know, guys, writers are watching these tapes now yeah. and they like the words. They worked yeah. very hard to get them on the page. Uh, since the writers are very involved in these decisions, it's a good idea to use the words the writer came up with, or I've at only least appear to be time, trying to. Yeah, I've only one time changed the words on the page, and I asked permission from the casting director. I said, I have an idea, which is that my character, it was a, it was a, Aquarius, which took place. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I said, uh, 
there, there's a Yiddish for, that my character is very obviously like the Jew in the squad room. And this line, there's a Yiddish phrase for it that that he would use. So it's the same line. It's just Yiddish. Can I do that? And she said, please. You oh, know? that's great. And I did it and I got the part, you know. So <laughs> my uh, feeling is when we're all working on it, right. I, I work by the Mike Nichols rule, which is best idea in the room wins. It doesn't yeah. have to be mine. First right. of all, it's a great idea and I like it. I'll say, let's use it and I'll get credit for it, even if you came up with it. So exactly. why would I why would I not want that? Exactly. But, yeah. Um, yeah, but, but at the audition, yeah, you did the you right thing. You brought up one of my favorite words, one of my favorite subjects, subtext. Yeah, because in my in my classes down at Chapman University with the with the screenwriting uh, and directing students, um, you know, these students come into film school now and they can technically they're amazing. They know more than I will never, ever know about how to push a camera around and how to make a beautiful film mm -hmm. that has no substance or story or character. Yeah. or relationship. And so we, we start getting into subtext and the definitions of it all are all terrible. Um, <laughs> you know, because every definition makes it sound like, oh, it's saying one thing and meaning another. So the students say, oh, so it's, it's lying or it's, no, it's not lying. Oh, it's being passive aggressive. No, it's not being no. passive aggressive. But what what do you think about? Are, do you find when you're writing that you write something and then suddenly see, oh my gosh, there is subtext in that, and I didn't I didn't see it as I was putting it down on the page, or are you thinking subtext as you write, or is it a combination of both of those things? That's such a good question. I think it's a combination. I know that in television. It's often on the set when you're rehearsing the scene or you've just watched the first take that you realize he doesn't need to say that. He should say this, but mean that. And you can see it. And I'm, if the actors, if it's an actor who's open to being somewhat fluid with it, I'll, I'll change it right there. Uh, I'll indulge another take. I'll, I'll, I'll take the hit for that. You know, television runs on the clock. There's always a line right. producer saying, you don't need so many takes, so much coverage. Stop that, stop that. Uh, but you have to get it right. You have to keep it as interesting and vital as it can be. So that's where a lot of that happens. But I'm always thinking, but mainly because I think in terms of objectives and actions and obstacles. Uh, I, When I first went on CSI, I could not write a scene for Billy Peterson's character, Gil Grissom, the lead investigator on the team, uh, until I knew what his super objective, if you will, was. And I thought, what super objective do you give a science nerd who solves crimes? And I realized it was order. His objective was order. And crime upset the order. A crime scene, something was out of order. And when I, it actually gave me a vocabulary. I never told him this, by the way. I never told other writers. I just used it. And I would try to think of whenever I was stuck for a word or a line, I would think order, order, progression, everything in its place, categorizing, order, there's a chain reaction. I would think of all those things and come up with the right thing. Okay. Uh, Rose uh, Sabin, Sabin uh, I don't know if this is somebody one of us knows, um, is asking, what is your definition of subtext? I don't know if she's asking you or me. Uh, why don't you throw out, do you have a definition that works for you? I actually have a couple. I always think of it as, um, I'm gonna use an image, Rose, not a dictionary definition. To me, subtext is the hidden spring. It's the water that's running just underneath the garden. You see the garden and all it's flowering, but there's something that's pulsing and running underneath. So it's it's the hidden action is what I think of as subtext. Now, when you, when you say the hidden action, because you said something about why don't you say this but mean this, mm -hmm. that's character subtext. And yeah. you could say that that is also um, passive aggressive, 
right? Or that the character is trying to hide something. I don't think so. I don't think it's necessarily passive aggressive. Not, not necessarily that's passive the aggressive. Character's action. It, but it, it, yeah. it's a conscious hiding of what you're, it's a conscious hiding of the objective. It could be. I like it better when it's unconscious. So it's not a lie. It's unconscious. Right. That's uh, what I like to get into because yeah. there's, 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 when you get to, there, there are two, two of my favorite examples. And one of them is an example of what I call, um, what I think of as character subtext. And then there's this other subtext that I think of as authorial subtext. Oh, uh -huh. And the, the two examples uh, are the, the, the fantastic scene in uh, Sideways when Virginia Madsen asks him, why do you like Pino so much? Do you know the scene I'm talking about? I do, I do. And he goes, he talks about Pino and he's clearly talking about himself. That he, he, and so we realize he's fascinated by this grape because like him, it's easily damaged. If somebody doesn't take care of me, I'm not going to blossom, you know, yeah. and he has no clue that he's talking about himself then, but authorial subtext, I think of as the scene in, um, crazy, stupid love when, uh, when uh, Steve Carell is in the backyard uh, raking up the leaves and um, Julia, and he's looking at uh, Julianne Moore through the window and she makes a phone call and his phone rings and it's her talk calling him. Do you remember this scene? No, believe it or not, I never saw this movie. Oh, well, well, they're in the midst of a divorce, and he's come over to the house late at night, and he's cleaning up the backyard and try, doesn't want her to know he's there. And he's looking at his wife in the midst of this divorce, and he still clearly loves her. And he sees her make a phone call, and his phone rings, and it, it's her. And he, he picks up the phone, and he's pretending to be somewhere else, obviously. And she's standing in the dining room and he's like what's up and she says um i'm i'm in the basement and the the pilot light is out on the water heater and i don't know how to get it lit again oh. and he leads her through how to do it and he's saying you know you have to you have to open that gray door and there's a red button and you have to push it. I wrote the word push. And he's so to me, that's author subtext saying, you know, this is marriage. You have to work at it. it yeah. When you're married and you have two kids, it's your the passion. The flame is behind this gray door and you have to push at it. You have to work at it or it's not it's going to go out. Um but I don't think that those characters have any clue that they're engaged in that conversation. I love that. One of the best pieces of advice, I, I got two great pieces of advice in a playwright's workshop back when I was starting uh, to write and wanted to learn more about the craft of it, not just go on instinct. And uh, a wonderful playwright named Paula Sismar gave me two great pieces of advice, the whole class. <clears throat> One is that, uh, Dialogue is not conversation, and conversation is not dialogue. That was very helpful. The second one, though, which relates to what you're saying, talking about, is remember, characters have blind spots. And I love that. What is the thing the character doesn't know about himself, herself, that we don't know, that we know? What don't they know that we know? And how does that affect their behavior? I really, really love that. That's fascinating. I always believe that Hamlet, he, you, ha, you can play Hamlet in that he knows how crazy he looks or he doesn't know how crazy he looks to everybody else. Uh, they're both valid. Each is a very valid approach to Hamlet. That's the beautiful thing about this 400 year old masterwork. Uh, no matter what you do to it, the play still comes through. It works somehow. You can put any interpretation, but as long as it makes sense in some way, it has to have a logic. But um, uh, that's a good example of blind spots. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, for, for people who are, who 
uh, aspire towards writing, um, what what advice do you have? The advice that I got that that helped me and that I tried to live by was my, my mother's a, a, a novelist and, and a playwright. And her advice was write what you know. I, I don't really like that advice. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, and again, Shakespeare. What did Shakespeare know about Renaissance Italy? What did Shakespeare know about Moorish uh, military leaders? What did he know about any of that stuff? And he wrote about it. He had a very good education. People say he wasn't educated. He actually did have a pretty good, uh, what we would call a middle-class education. He you know, went to Latin school and then he had access to great libraries and was an autodidact for a lot, but it still was a great education. He knew a lot. I think it's, I, I just think you have to write, find the truth. If you write what you know, then you're writing from truth because you know it, but you also can write what you don't know as long as you connect to the emotional truth of it. Right. And there you can get all the research to fill in all the little technical cracks. Uh, I learned that on CSI, working with all the cops and the criminalists. I didn't know the first thing about, about you know, uh, DNA typing and evidence collection and whatnot. I learned all that later. But what I brought to that table was, where did this character who's collecting the blood samples just come from? What were they trying to do? Were they interrupted? Were they expecting this call? What is their unique vocabulary? What do we know about them that can be learned or uh, conveyed through their work? What do they want? What's getting in the way? Where do they want to go? When do they want to go somewhere when this is done or stay here and collect blood samples all night because their life is so sad otherwise? Right. Uh, that's what I, what, I, what, I, what I knew. And that's the truth I looked for. So advice to writers, you know, I just got asked this from a high school student. Um, I spend some time with the students at the South Carolina Governor's School for the Arts and Humanities, the acting students every year or so. And one of them has started writing and he wrote to me the other day, worried that um, he didn't, what he was writing about, writing plays might not be important enough. And I said, at your age, write what excites you. Write what you can't stop thinking about. You'll get the craft, you'll get all of that. The one thing I would tell you is if you want it to be important, write about something where everyone will never be the same when it's over. Mm -hmm. Think about the great, you know, the simplest, most beautiful play, The Glass Menagerie. It's about a guy who brings a guy home from work for dinner to meet his sister. That's really kind of it. After that happens though, the lives of all those people will never be the same. It's a small thing, but that's what makes it important. So um, write what you care about and make it important. Yeah. I would say every every play has to be Passover. You always have to ask, <laughs> that's good. why is tonight different from all other nights? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, in fact, we were talking about auditioning before, and it's not always possible, but I do tell actors when they're doing, especially for these co-star parts where you've got maybe two, three lines. How do you make that interesting? How do you be the guy? Well, first of all, you're either the guy or not the guy. Right. I didn't know that till I was on the other side of the table, but you're either the guy or you're not the guy. But to help you get to be the guy, um, you have to find something in what you're doing that's interesting. It's so easy to just toss it off, you know, TV acting, just toss off the dialogue. But if you can find that one moment, that one little turn, um, the or not moment. I, I have a friend who was on a soap in New York and he had a, like a couple of weeks gig. And the guy he was in scenes a lot with had been on the soap for a decade or more. And yet scene after scene, this older actor was so compelling. And my friend asked him, how do you keep it so interesting? How do you keep doing this after all this time? And he says, oh, it's very simple. At the end of the scene, without saying anything, I just think to myself, vanilla or chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes he would think chocolate or vanilla, but it was silent. It was to himself. Nobody knew about it. Um, <laughs> wow! If you can find that thing, that chocolate or vanilla in the audition, it does help your tape stand out. Wow! If I were able to uh, to put a camera in my living room just about every night, I'd be <laughs> delivering a fascinating performance because 
there usually comes a time around 9.30 when I'm thinking to myself, chocolate <laughs> or vanilla. Yeah, there's, there's the secret of soap opera longevity. Yeah. Wow. You know, it's it's funny. I, I remember watching um, uh, Murder, She Wrote. Yeah. Which was, I, I hope nobody who ever worked on it is watching right now, but a, a, a terrible show. Oh, The Deadliest Small Town in Maine. Yeah. yeah. And, and yet, um, Angela Lansbury was brilliant on it. And and the writing I just thought was atrocious, and and she was brilliant. And I would watch her, and I would try to think, how is she brilliant with this terrible writing? Because she's rising above it every time, and she has to stand there while these people are spouting this inane, inane garbage at her constantly. And one day, and I kept studying it. And one day, I watched her, and I realized, oh my god. She's being polite. She has, great else, yeah. she has somewhere else she has to be. Something, something, but <laughs> but I have to stand here and listen to you. And 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 as soon as it's done, as soon as you're done talking, I'm yeah. going to go do the things that I really need to do. And it worked. I think that's wonderful. It reminds me of something I read recently uh, that Lynn Manuel Miranda said about um Hamilton, about writing Hamilton. And he started with Hamilton. He'd read the Ron Chernow book and everything. Right. But he related to the fact that Alexander Hamilton was restless. And he said, restlessness is always a great quality for a character, particularly in a musical. Yeah. Uh, and I, boy, I just took that to heart. What an amazing show. Oh, the greatest. The first Game time changer. I saw it. The first time I saw it, it was it was just spectacular because I I got a uh, an actually a private performance of it as my daughter and her best friend did the whole show for me in the living room. How wonderful! <laughs> that was that how was wonderful. How I saw the show. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it was pretty pretty amazing. Um, uh, I'm looking at some of my questions here. Oh, structure. Because you you have, uh, I run in, you know, uh, at Chapman, uh, different professors have different, different approaches. And I talk to my students a lot about structure. I talk to them about inciting incident or crisis. And I talk about acts. And then there are other professors who are like, that's all bullshit, you know, inciting incident and, you know, as how do you think about structure and do, do you think about, I mean, on television, obviously you have to. Um, you know. Yeah. Television made me think about structure more as a playwright, a lot more. And it would have saved me a lot of time. I think if I'd gone the other way first, um, I'm, I'm kind of traditional actually. I like Aristotle inciting incident, progressive complications, crisis, climax resolution. Uh, I think you can play around with it. Yeah, but in general, I think that's pretty good structure. And even in writing, uh, I just worked, uh, did the first season of a Netflix series that'll premiere in a few months. No commercials. It's my first time working in the streaming world. So we have this lovely, you know, 40, 50 minutes to fill. But just to be able to craft a story that that wasn't loose and sloppy, we would we broke the story. In acts, we would do roughly a teaser and four or five acts. Right. I think that's really helpful. Um, structureless things are are kind of boring to watch. Well, I, I often think that, you know, that structure is not so much has the, that the rules of structure, and we call them, you know, rules, mm -hmm. but I, I don't think of them as, uh, something imposed, I think of them as something discovered that we learned over time. Wow, good stories have these things. Mm -hmm. you know, a human body has a skeleton. And without it, it's not a human body. It's, yeah. it's not going to work. Um, so I, I try to think of structure as, as the things we've found bring it to life. 
as opposed to, and certainly, as you said, there are times where something doesn't have a structure and still works because it's doing something else. Well, in those cases, I think it's theme. Uh, theme can be a kind of structure when every scene or every moment is somehow running on a rail that's your theme. Right. Uh, I actually love when I work in a television room where we can talk about theme. Sometimes showrunners like to do that, and sometimes they feel that's esoteric and limiting. Uh, in which case, when you go off to write your draft, you write to theme, you just don't tell them that's what you're doing. Right. And it makes it a little more cohesive. But I do like thinking in terms of theme, big theme and then more narrow themes. Yeah. I always tell my students, Every every moment, every action, every piece of dialogue, every event has to further uh, four things: plot, tone, character, or theme. Right. And if it doesn't work on at least one of those, and maybe more than one at at the same time, it's gone. Yeah, go write a novel. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, in a novel, you have more freedom to to go down the side path that isn't gonna push the story forward, but is interesting right. in, right. in dramatic. Cause we, we identify, it's, our, it's just a, a quality of our species. We identify with, our, with the characters uh, that we're, we're watching them. And we want them, we want momentum. All of art is about momentum. Every revolution in art is momentum. The ancient sculptures were, um, you know, just a head, shoulders, torso, legs. And then the Greeks did this, committed this revolutionary act they, with the Koros statues. They had one foot proceed in front of the other. Actually, I guess it started with the Egyptians, but that one foot, that sense of momentum right. changed everything in art for the next millennium. And then, you know, we have light itself giving momentum in some of the Renaissance work. And then the great light and shadow show that revolutionized communication and the ex human experience globally is motion pictures. Right. From photography to motion pictures, it's always about momentum, light and momentum, light and momentum. Keep it moving. Okay. Favorite war story. Do you have uh, any <laughs> great war story? <sighs> My favorite war story. I mean, the one that, that, uh, <laughs> it gets me the most most drinks bought for me. Yeah. Well, yeah, actually, I do. Uh, it was, uh, I've had so many great experiences, particularly working in television, because I've been lucky to work with some amazing filmmakers uh, in the course of series, you know, uh, Martha Coolidge, who teaches at Chapman, and yeah. Quentin Tarantino directed a CSI with us, and William Friedkin, I uh, worked for Robert De Niro's company uh, in New York. Um, loved, Bob liked my office when he came to visit his TV show. He doesn't like to meet people. Huh. But the first day he came, I got a phone call. The showrunner was on set on location. Um, and like, I was the next in line as title wise. And so I was put on alert, greet Bob, don't let him have to meet people. So I was very, you know, respectful and said hello. And by the way, I really, I don't know if you know him. I really enjoyed him. And I, uh, I've never met him. My dad's worked with him, but I, I yeah. wasn't around at the time. He, he said, uh, can I sit in your office? And like, I'll just watch you. And I said, oh, okay, I'm writing. He said, is it all right if I watch you writing? I'd like to watch you. So I said, sure. And I had, we had these tiny offices at Chelsea Pierce. They were so tiny. Um, we had Ikea love seats for sofas. We didn't have a sofa you could stretch out on to read a script. I mean, they right. were tiny. And Bob kind of sank into it, one arm over the back, one on the armrest in this phone booth office. And uh, he watched me type wow. for about 40 minutes. And thank God the phone rang and it was editing. Could I come down and look at a scene? So I said, Bob, let's go look at a scene. We went to editing. Wow. And then he had enough and he went home. But every time he came to the studio after that, he recognized me and I was, you know, I was the comfort zone for Robert De Niro. Now, what drew you to, because we, uh, I, I keep trying to remember if we met on Tug of War or if we had met before that somewhere. 
I, I we met through LA Theater Works, I believe. So it was it was at the first reading of Tug of War, the one at their office. It may have been. You didn't do uh, Adam's rib for them, did you? No. I may have seen you on stage because I I'm an audience member as right. well. As, okay. Uh, playwright with them. I may have been the tug of war. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, was that a commission or yeah. was that, was that a, a project that you wanted to do? It was a commission. It came at a terrific time. Uh, I had just done the first the record breaking first season of empire. It was a phenomenal experience and, uh, I absolutely loved it, but they shook up the writing staff for season two, which is not unusual in right. series television. And I went to work on a show, um, I better not give the title, but uh, okay. it, it was on not one of the bigger networks, but an emerging network, a one hour drama. Uh -huh. a friend was running it and we were so happy working it together, very small staff, just four of us, uh, plus the showrunner, a couple of assistants. And for a lot of reasons, none of which had to do with the writing whatsoever or any of the writers uh after six weeks we were all fired and a whole new showrunner and a whole new team came in and again nothing to do no one even read what we were writing uh we all got paid it was it was a great gig uh and that's when i was about to go to england to work on a show about young william shakespeare for tnt anyway in the as that is happening the 2016 election is underway and susan lowenberg the uh, artistic director and producer, and one of the founders of LA Theater Works called me and she said, I think I want to commission about, I want to commission a play about presidential leadership in a crisis. Cause I see how this election is might turn out and I think it's going to be really relevant. And I said, Susan, I've just been fired from a job. I have nothing to do at the moment. It's research heavy, but I'll take it on. And then I got the job to go to England. So I hired an assistant to read all the research and outline certain things for me. So it would cut down my research. I ended up paying him more than I made to write the play wow. because it took so many hours. It was about the Cuban Missile Crisis. There's no quick way through that to do it right. well. And then I went to England and, that, and that's where I wrote the play. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. It's really, I think it's a terrific play. I want to see it staged, not just live in the audio space. I want it live. It was a good evening. Oh, it's great. It was a good evening. If I say so myself. Yeah. And the, the cast, <laughs> look, think of that cast we had, including you. Weren't they amazing? They were amazing. Yeah. They were amazing. Yeah. And I got to play a wasp for like the first time. <laughs> really? Somebody named Llewellyn. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the CIA chief. That was a stretch for me. Um, <laughs> you did it very well. You passed. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank yes. you. Um, well, listen. Uh, this is this has been great. Um, I, I want to, you know, thank you for coming in. Unless you have any last words of advice, I want to let you go. Go make your dinner. Uh, I have a. I do have one final word of advice. Actually, Ooh. since you asked, it's something I always like to talk about. If that's okay, I. I I just yeah. want to stress the importance of preparation. Oh, okay. Uh, it's so important. Um, whether you're sitting down to write page one, whether you're going into the first rehearsal or walking on the set or delivering your draft, preparation is everything, even if it's a meeting. It's, there's a quote I like from Hamlet. If it be now, tis not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. And I, you know, when I got that call to interview for CSI, I was not the first name on the list that the Geffen Playhouse gave C, the CSI producers. I was the third name. The first two were Pulitzer winners who didn't want to drive to Santa Clarita for a meeting. Uh, I had neither Pulitzer nor an empty tank of gas. I drove up there and I had made some unsuccessful attempts to get into television before, but this time I was prepared. I did the homework and it changed right. my life. And uh, I just can't stress it enough. When you come on that set, everybody expects you to have the answers. You have right. to be prepared. We have a question here from McKenna, who I uh, suspect is a student at Chapman. Um, and she's asking, is there any big difference between writing a play and writing for television? I think the answer yes. is yes. Huge but difference. Why don't you why don't you uh, 
expound on that a bit. Well, I'll tell you simply, the theater is a poetic medium. Film and television are literal media. So in a play, you are writing to create a world that the actors and the audience create together. It's not just a realistic depiction of a scene. In, uh, in film and television, the director can direct the audience's attention where they want them to be. They can fill the frame with as much information or as little as they want. So uh, in the theater, you have to really choose every word so carefully, every nuance and every progression of story and character have to, they just have to be crafted so carefully. But the thrill of that is if you do it right, you and the actors, the audience create this. Oh, Leonard, Leonard's dog walker is here. He's very ah. excited. You create this amazing world and uh, this amazing experience. You create, you know, a Hamilton or a glass menagerie. Uh, Nothing you're, I've created in that league, but uh, you're reminding me of the beginning of um, Tally's Folly. Uh, yeah, Lanford Wilson's great play, where uh, where Matt Friedman walked into the theater, and and the the one of the one of the two characters walks into the theater and starts talking to the audience about that about this world that we've created and you have to use your imagination. This is over here and that's over there. And this is going to last an hour and a half, but you know, in case you need to go to the bathroom or get a drink of water, there's not going to be an intermission. And he, he sets the whole mood. It's so right beautiful. The beginning. Oh, it's an amazing play. It's also uh, Tom in the glass menagerie coming it's out, a, yelling yeah. the audience, you know, I've got, uh, magic in my pocket tricks up my sleeve, but I'm the opposite of a stage magician. He gives you illusion with the appearance of reality. I give you truth in the pleasant guise of illusion. Uh, yeah. I, I love that leap that those plays take. And then the, the door they open for us all to walk through. Yeah, beautiful. The magic world. Yeah. Well, on that note, I just want to thank you so much for being here. And uh, those of you watching, thank you for joining us today. And please remember to subscribe to this channel. Also, uh, I do another show with my brother. It's less academic, a little more silly. It's called Two Brothers Talk About Food and Movies. It's on Wednesdays at 7 Pacific, 10 Eastern. And uh, this Wednesday, we're going to be talking about the movie the Firm, starring Ed Harris, Gene Hackman, and some guy named Tom, right? Uh, there was some guy named Tom in it also. Um, so join us for that. And uh, again, David, thank you so much. I think this was really, really informative. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. I had a good time. And I will, I'll talk to you very soon. Great. All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm going to run our end titles now.